Hey 3DMJers, this is Andrea Valdez and you're listening to the 3D Muscle Journey Podcast. This is Q&A session 13 and it's our 130th episode. Holy crap, can't believe we've been doing this for so long. Thank you guys so much for listening, giving us feedback all over the internet, writing us all the best ratings and reviews, and some of you even giving us monthly financial support via our Patreon page for this show. We can't tell you how much it means to receive all the love, and we hope that we can continue to give it right back via this podcast, our blog, our YouTube channel, Instagram page, and wherever else we can give away useful free things. And one of the ways we like to say thanks is by answering your questions. So we will be doing just that today with Brad Loomis and Alberto Nunez. All of this episode's questions have been collected from our website, where you can all ask us whatever you want at any time at 3dmusclejourney.com slash QA. If you're already signed up for our monthly newsletter, you've probably already noticed that there's a giant button at the bottom of every email that directs you to this online form as well to collect questions. So you should probably sign up for that also at our website if you haven't already, because that's when, yeah, you get the monthly reminder that you can ask us stuff at any time. And they might be on the show or the blog. We do have a Q&A section on our blog. Um, or some other piece of content that we make. It's where we get a lot of ideas. So please, again, 3dmusclejourney.com slash QA if you want to type it in. Or every month on the newsletter, it's a big-ass button at the bottom. Anyways, um, thank you all again. And let me tell you all about what is on today's episode. Topics for this show will include our recommended length for a cut or dieting phase, what body fat percentage or pounds away from stage weight we like to keep athletes around, the minimum amount of training you can get away with without losing size or strength, the positive or negative effects of gaining weight too slowly or not pushing a bulk, protein intake when in a caloric surplus, refeed duration recommendations, and a whole lot more throughout as we try to hit every question from multiple angles and try to give you guys as much info and context as possible while the coaches kind of work their way through these things. So as always, if you have any feedback or comments on this episode, go to 3dmusclejourney.com or to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash team3dmj and leave it for us under podcast number 130. Let's get into it. Here is Q&A session 13 with Alberto Nunez and Brad Loomis. Okay, Juan asks, is there a recommended length for a cut? What's the longest you guys would recommend? Starting with a, with a short and sweet one. Longest we'd recommend a cut. Brad. I think the only thing we can probably offer is anecdotal type stuff, right? Because I don't think we have any like evidence on that, do we? Someone's going <laughs> to cut for two years. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's the thing though, right? If someone says like, I cut for five years, I mean, it, it depends on your definition of end of a cut, too. What a cold, sad life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I almost did. But, like, there's breaks. Does that include binge? You know, like, because some people might be like, I tried to lose weight for five years, but that's different than mm. actually being in a deficit for five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think because we need to include it, the contest prep is considered a cut. So mm-hmm. what's the longest a contest prep should go? Um, I think it depends on, like, I think the first time I did it, it was six months and they were eh, six months. I didn't diet that intense. Um, so the longer you do it, probably the more you can muster in terms of like time spent in a deficit, just cause you know, you, you have all these strategies to cope and, um, you know, you've been this lean before, have these little systems to help you make it through many different scenarios that, that can happen. So uh, for a contest prep, I'd say uh, the high end. Uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone, usually under most circumstances, diet for longer than eight months. Um, and then with contest preps, like I'd say the low end would be maybe six. So, so between six to eight months, I think is long enough. You know, I think that's the biggest issue with preps is like convincing people that they need something that long because everyone wants the three sure. or four month prep, which doesn't work. So, uh, but but that's contest prep. I think that's pretty understandable and i don't think juan is asking about um contest preps but just to to throw that in there yeah and to also throw in there there's always 
at this point, right, at this stage, we're not taking anyone that's like, I want to compete next month. We don't even take those people. But even then, like those people that are in the six to eight month range, I would say everyone on our roster at least gets diet breaks. I mean, definitely refeeds, but some mm -hmm. get weak or more long diet yeah. breaks often. Yeah. And then when you hear people that are on our roster for longer than eight months, but longer than those eight months, it's like planning or cutting those cuts in pieces or, um, yeah, it's not like they're in a deficit the entire eight months. Or See, and, and, and you're, you're good for answering that because I guess I just thought like the whole like fat loss phase, how long can it be? But his question might have also been um, how long can you – run consecutive deficit days for, you know, so like refeeds, no refeeds. Um, do you use diet breaks? Do you not? Um, so I think we should probably cover this pretty thoroughly just to make sure. So that was, yeah, that was, that was I can say in. anecdotally that I've run like eight months of a cut for my 2004 prep. Yeah. Um, I started right at the beginning of the year, like January and got, you know, really freaking lean come July. Um, but then I just, I, I didn't stay in a deep deficit, but it was still a deficit. Yeah. Right. I didn't do refeeds back then. I didn't know about high days. I didn't know about diet breaks. And after I did a show, uh, in 2003, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was 2000 and that was 2003. So I did a show in July and then I did another show at the end of August. So I dieted all the way through with no diet breaks January to August, and I was wrecked. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I, I remember being wrecked. I could not fill up for show day. I was so friggin' lean, it didn't really matter anyway. But I was weak. I didn't, uh, I couldn't press the same weights. I, you know, really, I was wrecked. And I can honestly say that eight months on a deficit was like maybe two days that we're in a surplus is way too long <laughs> <laughs> to be a productive way human so, so that was a linear think, fat loss phase in terms of caloric intake you just kept cutting the caloric more intake more. was meant to do one thing that was deficit deficit mm -hmm. deficit mm. well and then if if someone's saying uh like you said i don't think he means prep because he just said cut so like if i'm trying to get beach ready i don't know like, like the thing, I guess if we, if we're thinking of our normal person, right, it's like someone who lifts intelligently. So we have that. And then we also of our average, uh, listener, follower, whatever they, they lift, they're not already obese, which we have not, we work with people who have been obese or whatever. And we, we recognize that, but the majority of people just lift and want to look better. Mm -hmm. course, <laughs> I find that our. Um, and me being one of the people that started with 3DMJ, we're usually all like look better than the average person, but that's not good enough for us. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. um, let's say if it's a male and he's trying to go from like 18 to like 9% body fat ish, how long do you think that could take? And then we'll stop with this question. Um, you know, it'd be a very practical way of answering that mm. is, you know, that we, we recommend that people usually spend uh, for every month spent gaining you earn one a week of deficit time you know uh, yeah. um so you should always be able to clean up what you gain over the course of a month with one week i think that's pretty reasonable so if you gain for a full year hey so you get three months of cutting and that should bring you back to where you were so i think so long as you kind of like follow that four to one ratio you're doing it well so obviously a gaining one. phase is you know, it's a year and a half, it's going to need more time to clean up than a gaining phase. It will say, you know, seven months, right? So I think if you just kind of stick to that system for the most part, like you, some people might need a little, they might be, you know, a little bit more prone to fat gain. So they might need a little bit more wiggle room that, you know, than that. Some people can probably maybe even spend less time cutting to, you know, get, the, get themselves back to where they started more or less. Yeah. But I think if you, if you follow those guidelines, um, that should do it for you. Yeah, it's a good framework. Brad agrees. Yeah. He's nodding in agreement. Yeah. 
Yeah, because obviously looks like a gaining thinking. phase that was a year and a half long is going to take longer to clean up than one that was, you know, six months. You know, right, right, right. Brad doesn't look satisfied. Say something else, Brad. What um, are you considering? You're churning. Yeah, just I think it, it's relative to the how size the how big you know how it depends on what the size of the person is too, right? Because okay. I mean, a, a two hundred and fifty pound person. That is 18%. Um, they can be a little bit more aggressive. You know, they could probably lose 1% of body weight, which is what, two and a half pounds uh, a week, mm -hmm. um, and get down to, you know, reasonable body fat levels um, really quickly. They may not need that long of a time period. So, like, like Berta was saying, if it took them a year to get to 250, um, and, you know, I'm talking about a big person, right? Mm -hmm. And they're still in reasonable levels. They're not, they're not obese at all. Um, they could, they could, they could cut pretty quickly if they were a little bit more aggressive and went into a deeper deficit. Um, and typically those folks kind of tend to hold on to their, their muscle a bit, a bit better too. So yeah, it, it, I think it depends on the person. Obviously a, a small person say that it took them a year to get from, 120 to 160 eh, they might not be able to do that that quickly okay fair considerations as well yeah and i guess uh if it takes you longer than that then maybe you're not in a place to diet right because like i was saying there's people that say i've been trying i've been dieting for five years and nothing happens because you're not doing it right or mm -hmm. well or ready for it so yeah yeah okay i know people have been trying to do shows for four years it's like maybe we should learn how to off season. Let's go for now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. This one's a little bit longer. Uh, question two. Okay. So, mm, this might be a similar question though. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. So Dana asks, I'm competing in women's bodybuilding division in 2020. My priority is hypertrophy and meeting long-term big picture goals. And I feel pretty good with how I look. I'm paraphrasing. Um, but I'm wondering... Outside of the short time spent in a caloric deficit, if I would be shortchanging my gains if I cut down a few more body fat percentage points to be more aesthetic for summer months. So is there a body fat range that's more favorable environment for maximum hyper hypertrophy? I recognize mm -hmm. not being in a deficit and eating for performance is key, but if I do a quick little few pounds more for summer aesthetics, is that going to hurt my long-term goals? So she's looking at competing, say, a year out, because I think cause this is from a collection of emails that have been gathering for a while. So let's say it was about a year out, because I know some are, oh, no, 2020, that is a year out, JK. Mm -hmm. So she wrote this a couple months ago, but okay. Um, she wants to compete a year out. She thinks she looks all right, but like if I cut for summer, is that going to hurt my chances mm -hmm. of having a better prep in the long term? Yeah, you're right. This is kind of similar to the last question it's and actually think, not we just went there with the last question when mm -hmm. i think about how yeah. the last question was worded sure. it's not similar yeah. at all we yeah it was there. so short we have to cover everything i know we just one. made That's shit up it. sorry juan we just <laughs> <laughs> we probably didn't even answer no but um will that hurt her prep if she decides to do like a two-month mini i don't think so because your off season should have um gaining and cutting cycles you know um there's a lot of utility in them, obviously, to keep you from getting too fat, but also it keeps your dieting skills sharp, you know, hmm. because, um, yeah, yeah, it's when we once you've had a few fat loss phases, once you get back into it, you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot this is kind of how it is and it takes you about two weeks to really sink into it. So um, it really helps out with that. Um, and what I would just do in her shoes is just scale my planning so that my cuts come during the summer. And just work it that way. So, um, so no, there's nothing wrong with that. It's you know, there's going to be cutting and gaining cycles. Just make sure that they end up falling uh, somewhere in the spring, so that you can look right for summer. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. You know, it's funny is that I feel like it depends on if you're a good dieter or not. And I don't mean good, but like you said, skills. Like if if you mm -hmm. have the skills to diet whenever you want to, I think a, like you said, like a two or three month in and out, or like a few like let's say six to twelve week down and then back up, might be. Not only, it might actually be productive if you're doing a diet before your diet or whatever, like we've talked about before. But mm -hmm. if you 
are not familiar with prep and dieting is hard for you, trying to diet for a summer might might wreck you, to be honest. I've seen it go both ways. Mm -hmm. Would you agree, Brad? Yeah, no, the only thing that I would add to this is that um, if she recently went through a cut, I would not advise going into a cut for the summer months. Like, let's say that um, that she just did a cut, you know, earlier this year or the end of 2018, and she's really only spent, you know, what, three, four, five, seven months at most in her surplus. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if I'd advise it. You know what I mean? I, I would... I think this is fine, and I think we all we all go through, like Berto said, cutting and, and, and gaining phases, kind of like in the ratio that he talked about. But if this person um, just recently got done with a cut, and by recent, I mean to me, six months is recent. I mean, if yeah. you if you went if you got to essential levels of body fat um, and, and the kind of condition that the sport demands, you know, right now, six months. In a surplus, in my opinion, is not enough. You could have spent half that time just recovering, you know. <laughs> yeah. So if she recently dieted, I would say no. I'd say you will shortchange yourself going back into a deficit now, right. just for the the the, the 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 you know reason that that she's got it there. However, if she spent a good, reasonable amount of time in a surplus, you know, um, and a nice you know kind of a gaining phase, then then yeah, I think that would be fine. Yeah, good point that where you're, like we were looking at forward at first, but we have to also look backward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when making exactly. that decision. Yeah. A little okay. more context. Way to go, Brad. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, okay, I hear you guys talk, this is from Dominic. Dominic asked, I hear you guys talk about how you don't need to do very much to maintain your muscle mass or strength but I can't find anything in your resources to quantify that. Are you guys able to say something like you only need 50% of your usual volume to maintain strength or mass or some, or something of that nature? So I think that was worded well. Perfect question for Eric. I bet you Eric would know if there's anything out there, evidence-based that would be on this. That's true. He would know quantifiably. Which is yeah. exactly what this this guy asked. But <laughs> I know um, in your anecdotal experiences as, as coaches, right? Because y'all have way bigger rosters than Eric or I. Have y'all seen some people really dip down and be okay? Um, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean we we see it in powerlifters all the time. You know, yeah. we we go through with powerlifters, we go through high volume phases. You know, what, whatever you want to call it, metabolic phases you know, hypertrophy phases, et cetera. And then they, they taper way down over the course of like, sometimes as long as four months, uh, to peak for a competition. And obviously they get a lot stronger. Um, but they sure don't shrink, you know, and I can't say that we've done ultrasound cross-sectional diameters on, you know, vastus lateralis muscles and, and things like that on those folks. Um, but yeah, I don't see, I mean, sometimes we slash volume greater than 50%. Yeah. Um, given it's not a, it's not like a, a long period of time, but it's, it's still, you know, sometimes four months. Um, and they sure don't look like they lose any muscle, you know, look at, look at my man, Chris Kennedy, that's getting ready to compete next weekend at IPF Worlds. He looks yeah. bigger now than ever. Yeah. He's and I've slashed his volume. Run. <laughs> yeah. So I think I think anecdotally we can we can say that you know as not as it doesn't last for like a year or years. Yeah. And, and you periodize obviously, which we always talk about: bring volume up, bring volume down, three months up, three months down. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's safe to say that that you could slash it by fifty percent in a reasonable time period and not really lose much muscle. I yeah. think you need to offset, you know, you're going to have to add, get some weight on there, you know, while you're, we're, you're working those low reps and not very many sets. I think that kind of helps to maintain that size. But, um, yeah, I think that is what I've seen. Okay. He said mass and strength, which I think they can be kind of, we, yeah, they need, they're different things. Um, okay. Answer me both. So I think the strength is very individual. Like some people just 
absorb movements faster than others, right? What do you mean in, by that? In regards to, they learn movements. Oh, and, okay. you know, because for a strength athlete, it's, it's not just about creating a certain amount of uh, stimulus to a tissue, but, you know, it's, it's a certain movement pattern in, in mastering that. Keeping skills. So some people, like, literally, they squat 600 pounds and they squat twice a week. And then you might have someone else who, like, roughly needs twice as much, right? So some people just get the dance a little faster. Um, and the same thing if we're talking about, like, deconditioning some, right? Some people, you know, might lose it faster than others and, you know, need to keep their practice levels a bit higher. So mm -hmm. when it relates to strength um, – yeah, I think there's some individual differences in regards to how much you can get away with while still be able to being able to maintain and stay sharp. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's some. I mean, and and one thing I'll say is it, and it should be this way: is that the, the longer you do this, probably the less practice you need. Just because we forget about this, but like our ability to focus should be get greater and greater as time goes on. Um, like I've gone to the point where I can get my squat pattern my hip hinge to like move weight wise and i'm doing them once a week but that's because i'm paying so much attention to detail my warm-ups have a purpose and i'm getting by with that much work whereas a few years ago i don't know if that would have been the case i don't know if i would have i don't know if i could have focused at the level that i can focus now um so yeah i think when it comes to strength it will differ from person to person you know how i think you guys know how it is it's like some people are just really hard to get to move the way you want them to move. Yeah. Um, and those also tend to be the people who lose it much faster. Uh, muscle mass, uh, um, women just tend to hold on to it a lot better than men in general. Um, and for some reason, it's like young men who tend to lose it the fastest. Uh, like, That's interesting. So I'd be a little bit more wary with him. Whereas like with women, like if we're prepping and we just can't get, we can't do as much. Uh, like I'll cut it down to a third of what they were doing, you know. And, and sometimes you need to because, because the amount of food they get to eat, and that's, that's really all we can do. And I work really well in places where we can maintain muscle mass. And I'd say with men, um, or just just about anyone, fifty percent is is where you can go for a short period of time. Um, but when it comes to muscle. I, I think we're a little bit more durable than we give ourselves credit for mm -hmm. because when you look at, you know, the adaptation that is like muscle growth, it's like your body goes through a lot of trouble to make that happen. It takes a lot of energy and time to, you know, create this. So to say for your body to just be like, well, I guess we're just not going to need this because we're, you know, doing half of our volume. Boom, let me throw this whole thing down. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense from like an evolutionary standpoint. And our bodies are very good at finding the most like practical and efficient way of getting there. So with uh, structural adaptations, they tend to hang on a little bit better than we give them credit for. So long as, you know, the tension is there and and um, and the, the protein is in, you know, is being, is there in sufficient amounts. Uh, I'd say as low as 50% of your like off-season volume is is okay in most cases. For let now let's um, stay with the imaginary. Not now that we've definitely said we could be more, could be less, could mm -hmm. matter, could not. But let's say that 50% or whatever, or a third for the girls or whatever else said. Let's say for some situation we had to really cut it down for now. What's the longest you would leave it there without? As a coach, while being confident, we'll get this back pretty quick. Three months. I could do three months, and I would not be concerned. Yeah. I've had to do that, especially if you're eating enough. So, like, let's just say it's, it's something that has to do with your schedule. It's off-season. It's like next few weeks are going to be crazy. I'm super confident that we can maintain that. But I've also done preps where, like, roughly, like, two to three months were spent, um, you know, training with much less volume than we do in the off-season. And... To be honest, they they tend to maintain better than the people who I try to push. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think, Brad? Yeah, at first that kind of scared me. I was like, three months. Well, I'm glad he's got that confidence. But when when I think about it, a lot of times I'll spend a month tapering down a block, you know, and then I'll I'll spend a, a month or six weeks really low volume, and then I'll kind of spend like a month or six weeks tapering volume back up again. Okay. So I guess that's like three months. You know, yeah. when you think about it. 
Yeah. It's, it's kind of somewhere in that, you know, between 33 and 66 percent that we've slashed that volume down. I just kind of, you know, undulate things a little bit more instead of just kind of going abruptly kind of jump off the cliff. Yeah. So, and yeah, now that I think now that I think about it, it's, that's probably pretty similar. Yeah. And you'll mention a lot of reasons why, too, that I think is good. Like, Brad, you're talking tapers to eventually pop out a stronger person at the end of this, right? That's why we periodize. And then Bert saying um, for aesthetics or whatever, we have to do that a lot when someone has almost no food and no energy and has to hit the stage. Mm -hmm. And then we also mentioned schedule. Like, like if, like if you, if your uh, wife has a baby and you're, you know, a guy that has to help her out with that for six weeks or whatever, and you can only get a gym twice or something like that. Um, Trying to think, uh, if you're moving, mm -hmm. I don't know. Vacation. Yeah, that's a good point too, Andrea. You think about what's happening outside the gym. Like if you're moving, that's a lot of volume and moving furniture. <laughs> yeah. Slash out of the gym, you yeah. know. So that's a good point. That's a really good point, you know. Or like when we talk about other sports, like football players, you know, we slash their weight training volume way down when they're doing all those skills training and running and push ups and you know, stuff like that during the, during the regular season. So that's something to consider too. You can probably drop a lot more of your volume if you're moving furniture. <laughs> yeah. Cause I tell you what, we just moved and I felt like trash in the gym during that week. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask you all a favor and can we go backwards to finish the last question? Cause I sort of breezed over it. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, for the listeners, if we go back mentally to the girl who wanted, who was asking about maybe summer cutting, but still wanted to prep within a year. Um, but on the, on the back end of that, there was a question that was kind of like, but it, she said in general, um, is the overall physiological environment at say for a woman, like a healthy 20% body fat versus a, mm. a leaner, like 15 ish. Um, like basically it, is there a certain amount of leanness at which, um, you cannot put on muscle? Like, do you, would you see it, um, like, we've talked a lot about timelines, yeah. and would you see it more, do you all view it more as far as, like, the amount of time above or below, like, surplus or deficit, or do you see it more as, like, are you fat enough to put on muscle, mm -hmm. or too mm -hmm. lean to put it on at all? Do you all view it that way at all, or is it only in timelines? I don't know if I asked that right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think, yeah, just practical experience, like, including with myself, there's just a body fat range where you're muscle gain is going to be way more predictable. Yeah. Um, and I suspect a lot of it has to do with the fact that the training is just more consistent and, and, and better. Um, so, yeah, you, you can be running around way too lean to the point where it's it's hard to train, uh, produce overload as, consistency, as consistently as you would uh, if you were at a slightly heavier body weight. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely a yes. Yeah. Um, I don't like to. I don't like people to speak about body fat percentages because no one really knows what they are. Um, but I do feel that. So, you know, most people um, they do better work in the weight room when they're fifty to twenty percent above their estimated contest weight. Okay. But it's better that they start their contest prep somewhere between ten to twelve percent above their estimated contest weight. Um, so I do think it's honestly, it's a worthwhile service to have someone like you show them a physique picture and you're like, what am I aiming for? If you've never competed before, because if someone could just tell you that number, you can really pre-plan like your macro cycles around that and like have the benefits of being a bit heavier and then also make sure that you don't start too heavy because obviously that's just going to make for longer, uh, more intense dieting that you might not be ready for yet, especially if it's your first prep. So, um, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So what you're saying, okay, a few things there. You, I realize that it's easy when typing to throw out percentages, but yeah. in general, like I know that that's not a, a thing. That's not a thing that we ever talk about really between coaches. I don't know if that helps y'all listeners, but we never yeah. consider that. It's always through pictures. We never talk to anyone mm -hmm. about their body fat yeah. percent, literally ever. Um, yeah. But... Uh, for you to say that you think of it in terms of, um, as someone who wants to compete, you always think of it as how far their physique looks from stage lean. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, like that's your peak performance. And 
you know, like all athletes kind of have that too. Like powerlifters, like there's points in the years where they're much better at three rep maxes than like one rep maxes, and that's okay because that's appropriate for that time of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but you always want to know just how deconditioned you are so that you know you can, you know, like hit your peak at the right time. Um, right. So, so yeah, I, I do think it's important. Like, yeah. I actually love that question when someone will send me a DM or something on Instagram and they're like what would be my what would my contest weight be and i'm like good because this is very useful information for you to know you know what you know, everyone's gonna dm you now you fucked up i i, I would <laughs> like, so what is my body fat i can't get over eight under eight percent you know and it's like <laughs> right you're not eight <laughs> percent um so and also to summarize yes there is a everyone has a a and not, not like hard number, but there is a time where your body, regardless of what it looks like, there there is a place somewhere where it's not a, like she said, a physiological environment that is ready to put on muscle. Like, so whether you think you look good or not, sometimes it's just not a productive place for your body to be. And that just comes with what time and training, knowing what that feels like versus what it doesn't feel like. Um. Because there's not like a number we can throw out ish or like a look yeah. that we can throw out. Okay. Uh, like symptoms of what it feels like if you're too lean. I thought you were. Is that what you said? Um, kind of. I mean, I was. I wasn't saying symptoms. I was saying like how she was saying. Is there a percentage mm-hmm. at which there's a certain point where we can kind of in our heads we'd be comfortable being like at around this percent, people kind of okay. suck at training and putting on mass. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, but we yeah. don't, you're saying we don't have that, but do you have a, an approximate percentage away from, away from stage weight? And you said, yeah, like 10 yeah. percent yeah, of your body I'd say weight away. At least 10, but if we get to 15 and perhaps a bit over, it, it gets really good. Yeah. Um, really, really good. Brad, anything to add there? No, no, not really. Other than I, a lot of times to kind of look at the person and look at their pictures mm-hmm. The guy that kind of likes to quantify everything, that's the one, you know, qualitative thing that I do like to do, you know, because yeah. if a person's got some pretty nice round body parts, um, but not necessarily a lot of lines, you know, I think that person can still build muscle. You know, I don't think they're so fat that they can't build muscle, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But then on the other side, you can have somebody that's super lean, um, and doesn't have enough muscle to even have, you know, like muscle bellies. And you no, know, I think that's the, I think that's the person that's probably not very conducive to, to, I mean, I think they can build muscle obviously, but I don't know if they're, they're in a right stage body, you know, habitus body state to do that right then. Yeah. Cause we know people that need to eat to gain, like eat, eat to gain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And vice versa, right? We know people who've stayed lean and just look awesome the whole way up. And it's less mm-hmm. that's less common, right? Most yeah, people need some sure. fluff, much, need quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Really quick favor, guys. If you enjoy these shows and have been a listener for quite some time, we would really, really, really appreciate it if you could take the time to give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your preferred podcast app may be. Having lots of ratings and audience feedback makes our show become more visible across multiple platforms, and it supports our mission of helping as many people as we can to be the best athletes, coaches, and lifting enthusiasts that they could possibly be. So if you're not driving and it wouldn't be dangerous, pause this thing right now and give us an honest review over on your podcast app, and we would love you even more than we already do. Thanks for taking the time, and we hope you enjoy the show. Okay. Would y'all say A-K-I-E-M is Akeem? Yes, okay. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. So we had a bunch of questions, but we can unfortunately not fit all of them in this episode. But I did pick one that is sort of uh, dear to Brad's heart because it's been happening to him recently in a lot of places in his life. So we will, we will go there. All right, Akeem asks, I'm starting to train for a triathlon, which takes about three hours of my week for cardiovascular training. How do you handle athletes that do seasonal sports slash high cardiovascular activity as far as lifting volume, frequency, etc.? Because I know Brad has some football athletes. Brad has a weightlifter who sprints. Do so you want to tell mm-hmm. us about this? Yeah, those are always fun. <laughs> those are kind of fun to, to plan out. 
they're very time consuming because you want to you want to plan out like your kind of your entire because you know where you're going to be you know what you got to do right mm-hmm. and then you know where you are now and you got to plan everything in the middle you know what i mean and so that kind of gets fun it's very time consuming it's a lot of work but it's a lot of fun um and really Yeah, that's, it's hard to believe that a team could get by just doing three hours a week of cardiovascular training, preparing for a triathlon. I would think you would need more than that. Yeah. Um, okay. But, you know, I'm going to take his word for it. Because it could be a sprint triathlon. We don't know. Or yeah, he might true. be... I- like really bad at it, like me, and doesn't need a whole lot. Can't do a whole lot. <laughs> no, but you're right. It could just be for funsies, like a 5K or whatever. Yeah. I don't know, but it's all three yeah. of the modalities. We don't know. But yeah. that is yeah. a good point. A real triathlon probably, Ooh. yeah, it takes a long time. Or maybe he's just starting, right? Maybe now it's three yeah. hours, knowing that in three months he'll dedicate six to ten hours and another three. Yeah, months. yeah, yeah. But a lot of times it's it's it, it comes down to allocating your your resources um like we always talk about in, in periods right so obviously if he's going to be say that triathlon he's going to ride a bike he's going to run he's going to swim mm-hmm. okay so if he's spending an hour on each of those modalities um you know a lot of his upper body volume for swimming uh could be allocated to swimming and then the remaining portion kind of be allocated towards you know is weight training right Mm -hmm. um and then obviously with bike riding and running his weight training could be quite minimal in comparison to the amount of time that he's running and biking right and probably you're gonna you're going to increase the amount of time on the bike and running over time uh and decrease the amount of of weight training over time Right. So if he's starting maybe an hour of biking and an hour of of running um, and then possibly doing um, an hour of weight training twice a week, it could end up being that every half an hour that he allocates more to running and biking, he takes away a half an hour uh, from, you know, his weight training. Right. Um, Kind of replacing volume, you know, allocating your volume differently. And that's just kind of, I'm, I'm using kind of units as time. Um, but, you know, it, that's a lot of times how I'll handle multi, multi-modality uh, athletes. Um, you know, like even soccer. I treat soccer and, and football players. I treat American football players and soccer players. <laughs> right. Um, kind of similarly in that in the off season, there's not a lot of... Um, long duration running. Right. And so therefore, you know, they're, they're what conditioning we are doing will sometimes come from sp- footwork drills, speed drills, something that's really short duration and sometimes really intense. So then during that portion of the year, things has been a lot of time weight training. Mm-hmm. However, as they get into their season and they start doing soccer and they start doing football player, we'll start reducing all of that weight training volume, knowing that, okay, now not only are they going to be doing footwork drills and speed drills, but they're going to be starting to want to increase their cardiovascular fitness and their endurance and start doing more running, right. And start doing more, um, endurance type training, running hundred meter or hundred yard sprints and things like that. And then you've always got the, the, the fun part of saying, okay, well, this person that, that, that plays soccer as a bodybuilder. And so we're going to do their weight training probably a little bit different than the person that's not a bodybuilder. Right. So a bodybuilder, we we might take away their, their, their squats and their, their more precarious compound movements and keep like their, their isolation stuff in and their safe movements like leg presses and stuff like that. Um, because they are a bodybuilder, whereas somebody that's not a bodybuilder, well, you know what, maybe we're going to keep the squats in and some of those more precarious ones and then eliminate the safe stuff, you know, like leg extensions and leg curls and stuff like that. Because obviously squats and, 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 and cleans and, and things like that, they're a little bit more useful to a non bodybuilder, like an actual performance type of a, of a, of a sport. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a long, (laughs) that's a long answer to that question. 
but it, it's out. It all comes down to robbing and allocating your volume differently, depending on your, on your sport. Yeah. Uh, like exchanging. And, and, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and really, to be honest with you, in my, in my opinion, running different periods of training, probably uh, yeah, maybe I'm stepping out of, out of line when I say that, but um, in my opinion, allocating periods of training is almost more useful for a performance athlete, whether it be a power lifter or a team sport, than really a bodybuilder, you know, really. Because the bodybuilding, it's going to be all weight training. You mm -hmm. know, power lifting, yeah, it's going to be pretty much all weight training. Whereas you start getting into those those team sports, weight training is one um, component or whatever. Aspect, component, there you go, yeah. of training. Uh, when you've got, you know, that component that works to work in conjunction with possibly five other components. Right. Yeah, I guess in the triathlons, like, like how, when you started up, you said um, you can think of it as the body parts, right? Because it's mostly legs for a couple of those and mostly upper. So if you did an upper-lower body part split and you were doing upper-lower, upper-lower, upper-lower three days a week, you could just take out one of each, you know, and mm. then add it. And like you said, just, it's an easy way to exchange it rather than, um, that would like, cause you said time too, that was another way to exchange it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but whatever that yeah. unit is for you. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I'm going to, I know we say this anyways for all of our athletes, but especially when you're trying to do something like that, I would hire a coach for sure. Cause it's really yeah. rare that, that, um, that someone who is not already a coach or not already a competitor in these sports would know. Um, we, we can tell you the basics or whatever, right? And if you are primarily a weightlifter who wants to, or primarily a bodybuilder who wants to do the triathlon for funsies on the side, we can do that. But if you want to be like real good at, at one or the other, or you know, if you want to be real good at the triathlons, your priority, you might want to hire a coach that does that. And then, like you said, the you priority is a few coaches, Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, you might want to run, hire a coach that runs your programming and then hire a swim coach uh, and then hire a other, coach. Yeah. 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 It's something that, obviously somebody that wants to do a, a compete at a high level at something like that. Um, you would, you would want to almost have a team of coaches, one that mm -hmm. is overseeing all of the, the programming and, and allocating the different components like we talked about, but then have your specialists. Yeah, that's you know. what, uh, what's it called? Brute Strength is that the ones who had us at their house, Mike Casu? Mm -hmm. And then they have a team mm -hmm. of coaches like that. But, and that's what, um, man, and I don't, I know, I don't know if our podcast listeners want to hear this, but a CrossFit coach would be better for that too because they do both. Mm -hmm. If you don't have bodybuilding goals, because right? that's the thing is bodybuilding is a, is a little more specific, but if you just want to be a strong person, who looks pretty good at the beach and triathlons for funsies. I would, there's better coaches than us. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Alex sure. Biata is another one. He's okay. He's all about that. I think uh, he's ran miles under five and can squat in the 600s. So <sighs> yeah. damn it. It's better than all of us. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Although what he said, three hours is not too much. Like when I think of three hours in terms of cardio, like Our, yeah. contest people. preppers do that all the time yeah, yeah yeah and even sedentary people like they work in the office all day and they're just they they need a little something that's about yeah like i can see four sessions being about three hours for someone who yeah. they need it in order to not gain too quickly so mm -hmm. for him his situation specifically that's yeah, not even that out of hand right he might not need to change anything you yeah. know yeah it might just be weightlifting plus light it depends how yeah. intense it is right like if that it's is that. true yeah yeah Okay. Jai. Jai? J-Y-E. Jai asks, I work a very physical job and my maintenance since around 4,500 plus calories a day. With such a high caloric burn, can my protein number stay the same as what is recommended for typical bodybuilding training needs and the remaining excess calories come from carbs or my protein numbers need to come up as well? Uh, Bert, you eat a lot. You want to go with this one? Let me see it so they can get it down completely. Okay. Who was this one? Oh, okay. Jai, number uh, six. Six, Jai. Um, yeah. Well, Bert, okay. while you're looking and collecting yeah. your thoughts, I can say that I've got an athlete on my roster that I've had for a long time mm -hmm. that could probably be Jai's brother. 
<laughs> what if it is him? And this was before he got on your roster. Just kidding. You probably had him for a long time. Yeah, yeah. But he's he's a landscaper, so super oh. physical. Yeah. Uh, he diets on four thousand calories. Um, All right. So that how physical this guy is. He's 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 kind of a freak. Um, and with him, you know, really to be honest with you, I. I give him free reign to get those calories in because mm-hmm. I mean, maybe Bert, cause he eats a lot more than, than I do. When you're eating that many calories, you almost can't help, but get in greater than your average amount of, of protein, you know, right. uh, it'd be hard to do. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of calories. And with him, I, a lot of times we'll just have him track his calories and you know what? He just goes to bed and he consumed 250 grams of protein. You know, mm-hmm. um, and this is only, let's say, I got to think about it because he's, he's 90 kg, give or take. So he's like 187. He's taking in 250 grams of protein in his sleep, you know, not even thinking about it. Yeah. I think you have to, to be honest with you, without feeling like gross eating so many carbs and fats. <laughs> yeah. When caloric needs get that high, I think it's more about what makes it. Like outside, this is assuming they don't have like these weird habits. Like somehow they eat four thousand calories, but they left up to their, own, to their own doing. They only have a hundred grams of protein, right? But um, yeah, when we're talking about numbers like that go up that high, it's like okay, what's going to make this easiest for you, right? Uh, because a lot of our bare minimums are going to be taken care of, so long as you. Just remember a few fundamental principles, right? You know, here, this is how many fruits, how many veggies. Find ways to get these in. Make it easy on yourself. Um, here's our protein intake. Here's, like, you know, kind of the bare minimum. You can go to that if that makes it easier for you because for some people, too much protein can, you know, make it get hard to away. eat. Yeah. Or for some people, a certain ratio of, like, fat to carbs makes it hard to get that food in. Whereas, like, if maybe they went higher fat uh slightly lower carb it's easier but sometimes it's the other way around so whatever makes it easiest for you especially if you are in a hypercaloric phase where there's enough of everything right um i'd be a little bit more picky about how we plan everything if there isn't enough of everything but protein which is when we are dieting because when we're dieting it's like we set the protein we make sure there's enough of that but since there's not enough total calories now we have to be a bit pickier with our fat and carb distribution but when you're in a environment where we have enough of everything, it does not matter nearly as much. So yeah, make it easy on yourself and whatever that might look like. Yeah, so if bare minimum, um, if having more than, let's say, a gram per pound of body, which I know is not, it could be lower. But if you feel like that's, that's the general thing that's easy to adhere to, right? A gram per pound mm-hmm. of body weight and... Um, eating like 1.2 or 1.3 or two full that you can't get in your carbs or mm-hmm. all the calories, then it's like, fuck it, drop it back down. Yeah. I'm getting less than a gram per pound right now because otherwise it's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, too full. Yeah. I make 160 grams a day. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, and like you said too, some people, if they have a lot of fat, feel super full or if they have a lot of mm-hmm. carb, feel super full. Yes. And I honestly, I got to be careful when I, not now, when I was doing like two a day sessions and eating a lot, when I had a, I had to, it was hard for me to get any fruits or veggies in. Um, it just was, I had like, I would do it, but I mean, I had to think about it real hard and like plan it. Whereas when I was leaner, it's like, oh, I just get fucking salads all the time. Yes. Like veggie sides all the time. But then it's like, I would be too hungry if I did that. And so, and that's because that a lot for me was like. 25 to 3,000. So if yeah. it's this high and what you have to eat, Bert, I don't know what I would do. Yeah, well, I mean, shakes, I right? get them in the morning. That's the only the way. Morning. If I don't get them in the morning, because it's the closest thing we are to hungry, or at least empty, yeah. um, it's easier. Yeah. But it goes back to Henry, that. What's can practical? I ask you why it was hard to get your fruits and veggies in when you were yeah, that so act, eating that much food? If I, like, man, there was a period there when I was, like, my second year of grid training, like, when I was really into it, uh, where if I would have, like, a salad, I'd be, like, 30 minutes later hungry again, but I'm hungry. full. And I'm like, shit. Oh. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, um, like energy hungry. Yeah. But my volume was too full. But you're, yeah. correct. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Gotcha. 
your, and, your energy levels were telling you you should eat, but your stomach was not. Right. Yeah. And like I'd have and another I did, session yeah. and I'd be like, oh, what do I? How am I going to do this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. when I started like okay. drinking Gatorade oh, and, yeah. and um, like at night, like I would try to do the, the, the denser veggies. And like I would, I was like, no, zucchini, cucumbers, to, like I was like, I need carrots, bananas, like, mm -hmm. you know, trying to just get stuff that's a little easier. Um, or I would get a smoothie. That's the, we go, I was like big on smoothies for a little bit there to yeah. liquidify it all. Yeah. Uh, but whereas like, man, to, oh, go ahead. That's, that's something that's hard to describe to people when you're energy hungry. Yeah. Versus volume hungry. But I'll tell you exactly. what, it's the exact yeah. opposite in prep. I could eat the biggest salads, no problem, you know, and yeah. I can barely eat regular salads now. But when I was, yeah, when I was prep, it was like every meal was so big and I was never full. Right. And then the opposite yeah. when I was training real hard and had a lot of muscle on me, it was the opposite. And I'm sure that's what Berta runs. Well, I don't know. At the time I was just like hungry all the time. But if I had a big amount of veggies, I'd be like, Oh God, like bloated and just didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Here's a crazy part prep. I'm never hungry, hungry, but I'm energy hungry, but it's mm -hmm. a messed up kind of energy hungry because <laughs> yeah. like you, you know that there's no such thing as one meal is going to cure this. Right. <laughs> you know, you're like, it's you're like, you're like, I, I have all I day. Need, it's not going to work. <laughs> I need like a whole month of eating to feel like not this shitty, but yeah. it's, it's very similar to what you describe. Yeah. Yeah. Except I could fix it with like a big ass bowl of apple jacks and like maybe some pop tarts because I wasn't dieting, you know? It was just yeah, like, yeah. Yep. Um, like it was like, because it's like shaky. I don't know. Energy's yeah, weird. It's much it's more weird. cute. Yeah. If you want to know what it's yeah. like, like maybe go on like a five hour hike and don't eat and then come home. That's kind of. Mm -hmm. And don't eat the first two hours you're there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And try to talk to someone. Yeah. <laughs> it was annoying. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, what do we have for you? Okay. Last one, friends. You ready? This is from Sable. Hey. Great name. All right. I've implemented 24-hour refeeds in my bikini prep before and have had success on the scale, but I'm always hungrier the next few days after. Um, I've been intrigued about 48-hour carbohydrate refeeds, but I've only found anecdotal information that they may be better, more effective for leptin and ghrelin levels. Is there science backing it? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on when a 48-hour refeed might be more beneficial than just a one-day. I mean, we have... Um, I'll, you know, I'll let you answer it. Y'all are the coaches. Y'all go ahead. You're going to do the plug, so she got to come back plug. with the plug. Yeah, yeah. What do we'll you mean do with the way. plug? I thought about the plug, we that we did something on that. Oh, well, no, I was going to say, um, I don't know, you know, I forgot what I was going to say. It, I think it mattered a little bit, but I was going to answer it. Uh, let me read it again. It might come back. Oh, because she's saying better for um, leptin and ghrelin levels. So, because there's there's that question, I think versus um, performance, right? So, am I am I hungrier the next day? But more importantly, like, are you performing better? And then also, are we still? Is this does it keep us moving on the scale? Like, those are all the considerations. And like she was saying, it's she still was able to lose weight, but the issue was that they made her hungrier. Yeah, and and this I have a theory on this Let's myself, um, because a lot of times our bodies, you know, they get so good at conserving energy that a twenty-four hour refeed is just like a little bump in the road, mm -hmm. and so it really doesn't actually do much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It just kind of like keeps conserving energy. It's like, oh, okay, here's here's more food, but you know, we're we're still going to keep respirations at you know ten per minute, you know, or we're going to keep heart rate low or, you know, all that kind of stuff. We're not really having a reason to, to increase it. Whereas if you have a 48 hour refeed or sometimes I'll, I, I don't have a problem. I got a few people right now. They're doing 72 hour refeeds where we bring up calories like three days in a row. Mm -hmm. That's long enough period of time for your body to just kind of rejuvenate itself a little bit and not have a reason to conserve so much energy, you know? And so, yeah, a lot of times, again, anecdotally, those people are a little bit more hungry. Or like if we run a, a little extended diet break where we, 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 we've dug hard and we're having a week at maintenance calories or we're having a week at, you know, like a very small surplus, like 500 calories a week, right? They come out of that just ravenous, you know, and 
my theory is, is that's just enough period of time. Heart rate comes up, blood pressure comes back up, respirations are back up. You're sweating a little bit. Start pooping again. Exactly. Your bowels start moving. Yeah. And so what happens is, is that now we take that food away and your body is still churning at that rate. Yeah. And it hasn't figured out yet that we've taken the food away, mm -hmm. you know, um, or sometimes even before the refeed is over, they're ravenous because it's just enough period of time. And it's like, thank God I've got one more day. <laughs> yeah. It makes me hungry <laughs> for sure. Like during it, I have yeah, that, my yeah. first big bolus of carbs and I'm like, Oh shit, here we go. And like the whole body is just like, yeah. 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 But that's kind of my theory is it's just, it's, it's when it's too short, but it's, 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 still, it's not, it hasn't recognized it. It's just going to keep all that stuff. So, Sub, you know, subdued as much as it can to conserve energy. But when you have more period of time, and I really truly believe that's why we have a, um, a better time dropping fat. And I can't remember which study it was. I think it was Veriday or something like that back in 2013. Check is when out. people had higher time frames of, of refeeds, they actually lost fat better. Mm -hmm. Because I truly believe that when that body gets that all those metabolic functions built back up again and we take that food away, um, it churns fat better. I really, I really truly believe that. Do I have actual scientific evidence of that? No, but boy, you see it all the time. <laughs> see, we'll encourage a billion athletes though. Oh, and, and yeah, you just, yeah, you get a jump on the scale after the, the 48 hour or the 72 hour refeed. And then sure enough, by the end of that week, you hit a new prep low and then it jumps and then by the end of that week, you hit a new prep low. You know, it's just so it's almost it gets almost scary how predictable, you know, it is. So yeah. We we are talk about it all the time. Yeah. It's normal to have that happen. The whole I get hungrier on my refeeds. I think yeah. that's just about everyone. Um, but I, I guess and you mentioned this a bit, Andrew, it's like if you're competing yeah you can try to minimize like the whole i'm hungry because that sucks but you're doing this like for the sake of like the final product right to get better so mm -hmm. whether you go to 20 keep 24 or this time you go with 48 it should be more so about like what's going to make me better at the end of the day you know um and it does take a while uh, for an athlete to get to the point where we can make the majority of our decisions based off like that bottom line what makes us better Mm -hmm. But uh, that that's definitely the goal. Uh, and I think the whole hunger situation is probably something that um, they're going to have a much better, they're going to have much better success navigating through that by looking at other things. Because um, hunger is such a funny thing. It can happen for so many different reasons. And everyone experiences hunger very, very differently. Um, so that just goes back to knowing yourself more as, as a dieter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like learning to frame all these situations correctly in a way that makes them more comfortable. But, um, yeah, you, I mean, you have people who are, I mean, obviously there might be hormonal reasons for that. There's often something really wrong with these people. But you, you'll find people who are 600 pounds who they're ravenous if they eat under 6,000 calories, you know, yeah. they exist. So uh, a lot of that part is just something that with time you're going to get better. There's so many moving parts when it comes to hunger yeah. and and it's not the refeed is going to fix that. Yeah, not the duration. Well, um, also, it might help, yeah. yeah, anecdotally as a competitor, what I when um, because when I start eating, like Brad said, like thing I can feel uh, like <laughs> in deep prep. I don't even get hungry anymore. Like, fuck it, it's just time to eat. But um, what is that? Is that lightning? That was lightning. Oh, yeah. Holy crap! Or thunder? Um, it's okay. But what would, what would help me or whatever, like on refeed day, I wouldn't even start it till like 5 p.m. So I go to bed full, don't even worry about it, and just load them all in there so that I'm not mm -hmm. like, because if I start eating a lot at the beginning of the day or eating 50 mm -hmm. more carbs at breakfast, say I'm hungry the rest of the day. So I would just save it all till the nighttime. See, and it's things like that that you learn with just more dieting, yeah. you know? Right. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the food choice, like, yeah. I don't, you know, like, um, if what you're eating is also, your carbs are very like high sugar, very yeah. dense. Um, 
then it doesn't matter if it's one day or three days, like all your days are going to suck if you're a, a, a bikini competitor, right? So we know she's yeah. a small girl. Yeah. Um, and by small, I don't mean height. I mean like a, an already lean female, her refeed can't be anything that allows for like a piece of cake or something yeah. without ruining the rest of your day, right? So food choices, timing. Um, yeah, I know the fruits for me, like wonderful, but anything starchy, yeah, it, it gets going. It, yeah. Like I just, I want more, you know, more of that cereal or whatever. Yeah. 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 And that's a good point. Food choices. I yeah. mean, I think I just heard the other day that there's something in cheese that makes you want to eat more cheese. You know, it's delicious. That... Is that what it is? <laughs> I love cheese. But it's but so yeah. different from person to person because like whey protein shakes that's fill me up. What? Like yeah. when I'm prepping, I'll have whey, I'll have like for four straight days, nothing but whey protein. Oh God. And it's like, I feel great. But uh, for some people, it's like, that's such a waste. I want something to chew, and that does nothing See, for me. animal protein matters a lot for me versus yeah. a shake. Like, I can have a shake once a day, but I can't have, like, multiple protein feedings being shakes. I'd be, like, starving and headachey. <laughs> Don't make fun it's of me. Weird. It's not weird. <laughs> it's not weird. Yeah, that's why we love you, Andrew. You're like a true carnivore. What? <laughs> Yeah, carnivore. I could just see you as a cave woman, just like <laughs> acting animals and just biting their throats out. And no, eating. they're so cute though. <laughs> they're so cute. No, as long as you kill them before they come to me, I'll eat. I'll eat them. <gasps> and then I have to have beef every so often too. And Eric makes fun. Of me. Or no, is it Bertha makes fun of me for that? Like I'll know. I'm like I no, need I a, a burger great. or steak, not just chicken. Yeah. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Eric. I probably cheer you on. <laughs> yeah. I think it has to do with my. Uh, Low red blood cell count, which we'll talk about some other time, but not right now. Okay, so I think we did it. I think that was a good episode. It's been about an hour. Um, thank you guys for joining me. Do you have any parting words? I hope they enjoyed it and that our, we made their drive a, a little, if I'm assuming a lot of people listen to this while they're commuting, made their drive a little bit more exciting. Or um, made their cardio a little bit. Uh, yeah, that too. Yeah. That, what else that do people do? They didn't go faster. <laughs> I like walk, to listen they to get stuff. Their steps when, in. Oh, steps, yeah. When I'm folding laundry. Yeah. And in that's the morning so I'm getting ready. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully we were a good company to y'all. Yeah, hopefully. Thank you guys for the questions. Um, and this is the end of the season. Yay. See y'all. Yeah. Not that it, we're still gonna see y'all in two weeks, but thank you for listening to 130 episodes of our Ooh. rambling. Okay, Way you. to go, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs>